33, we uh, read, Behold how good and how pleasant it is uh, for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that run down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Uh, imagine the picture, having oil, you know, all over the place on your beard. Well, you guys don't have beards, many here. You mean the big one, you know, and it's, it's, so that's, that may not sound like a very attractive um, idea, but um, it is. I mean, it's obviously a certain cultural thing. The whole idea, I guess uh, maybe imagine you are working hard on a roof in a hot day and then just pour water on you, right? I mean, that's the idea. It's just overwhelming and pleasant blessing. And that's uh, what um, the Bible shows us here. That's what unity of brethren is like. And uh, uh, I think, um, I remember once I was, I think in Nanaimo or somewhere, I went for a walk. And uh, <clears throat> as I was walking out to this little peninsula, a group of uh, young people were coming back uh, the opposite direction. And they all were very well dressed. Uh, women had long shirts and they were just jolly and happy and polite and I said, like, uh, there's no way that these are not Christians. And uh, it's just a beautiful thing to see. What well, the world uh, looks as beautiful is, I don't know what, uh, uh, maybe fights, uh, you know, all sorts of luxuries and that sort of thing. Uh, maybe certain abilities, somebody accomplished something really great and we all crown him and give him a, a I don't know, a Stanley Cup or something, you know. That's what uh, we look up to. But actually, that's not really that exciting. The exciting is when uh, when people live in unity and in harmony in some ways, all right? And so that's what uh, David praises here. And I only decided to bring this up in the context of this visit of um, the um, chief apostate, as I call him, uh, to uh, this province, uh, the Pope, the so-called Pope, the Papa. You know, he, he is coming to here to, to do what exactly, right? Now, we would like to think this is the chief apostle, I think they call him also, right? Uh, the, he, he is coming here and he's going to then be apostling people. Is he going to bring the gospel? Well, of course not. He's going to, he's coming here for uh, political reasons. He's coming here for... Uh, to, to maintain his power grab, to maybe patch some holes and, and you know, kind of boost up uh, the morals of the local Catholic uh, dioceses and all that stuff. Uh, and it's actually sad uh, to, to see so many people looking up to, to the Pope. And I'm sure people will go there uh, to a bunch of his uh, gatherings and they will come out of there and say, what a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing it was, you know. And it's great that he brought healing and he brought... Uh, so much to us, and then we will. Uh, what, what a wonderful thing! But we know it's all fake, right, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> it's very, it's very uh, actually damaging and disturbing and breaking any kind of proper harmony, because it brings deception and lies. That's uh, really what it is. Uh, so I can't think of more apostate uh, group out there that actually preaches uh, false gospel. I, I guess we could pick up Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and we would be definitely correct, but uh, this is a big one, right? And uh, they claim to be the only right church, the Catholic church, right? And, and so uh, that's why they're so uh, effective in their damage. Now, as I was preparing for this, I came up to this uh, document that I had stored for a long time. And so I clicked on it to, because I knew that uh, it's, it's a good long word document with a bunch of information about all sorts of religions. And uh, I don't know all of the religions and sometimes I have to pick up, sometimes my kids or, you know, you bring up some names like, who is this? You know, I don't, I don't keep up with all this stuff. Uh, so I wanted to a little bit look up at some religions, what they teach, including Catholics. And uh, I came across at the beginning about this, uh, to this name, uh, James... Freeman Clark. Anybody knows the name? James Clark? Uh, well, don't worry. This is like 150 years ago. But he was a Harvard University professor. He was a professor at the Divinity School there at Harvard. And he was a so-called Unitarian. 
And uh, what he did, he studied religions for a long time and uh, basically <clears throat> trying to distinguish what, what is it that makes each of these different religions different from all the others. So kind of compare them and making them kind of distinct from each other. And uh, as, as he says, trying to determine its place, its use, its value in reference to what he called the universal absolute religion. That's a term that uh, these people used. And I heard about universal. We, we reject, I think I copied it when we make one of our first pamphlets. I think I copied it from Stephen Anderson. So uh, I think uh, we reject universalism. I think he had it in, in one of his parents. And so I said, I guess uh, he's talking about the Catholic Church. And sure enough, so I, I actually, we actually used it there. But later on, I realized, well, what does it actually mean? This universalism. Uh, I just know that it's probably not going to be good. Uh, he then wrote the book in 1868. It was published and then republished again in 1895. And uh, the book was called Ten Great Religion. And I don't know if he meant great by size or great by um, value. You know, uh, there is uh, not a... I, I just find it interesting it was ten. You, you, you study in the Bible, anytime there is a number ten, it's just never a good thing. You know, there is Ten Commandments. How many spies was it that turned the whole nation against going to the Promised Land? It was ten. How many days was it that uh, the husband of Bathsheba was kind of half dead before finally he died? It was ten days. You know, what was it, uh, these uh, ten, uh, uh, the beast, you know, with the ten toes and uh, ten everything? The number ten often is connected with just a bad thing. All right? It's a curse. Curse is through the law. And so I'm thinking, you know, that's a cursed book. Uh, but he says each religion is a step in progress of humanity. And he believed that Christianity is kind of at the pinnacle of that progress. Right? So, so for him, it was uh, evolutionary progress where Christianity is at the top. And, about, you know, he says in his study, it shows the positive and negative side of a religion uh, in preparation for a higher religion. And uh, so that the universal religion must root itself in the decaying soil of partial religions, of which Christianity is one of, right? Christianity was superior to the other religions, according to him, uh, and, uh, and so on. But he was talking about his ever-evolving faith, right? Then the legacy of this, so basically he believed in some sort of a convergence towards some sort of a final, absolute, universal all-encompassing religion. And if you are a study of prophecy, you know what that smells like. You know what this is about. This is where things are going. And of course, uh, if, if I am named, if our religion is part of their great religion, I think we're in a bad company. This is not really our religion. Because there is a lot of Christianity that is called Christianity, but we know it's not Christianity. And so let's be the 11th one, or I don't know, the 13th one. I don't care. We, we, there is no ten great religions. There is only one great religion. And of course, that's the religion of our Lord. Now, this goes on. <clears throat> uh, uh, basically, from this, uh, this uh, book and from this uh, mentality of the late 1800s, you had uh, pretty much this boom of all sorts of efforts by different religious groups to, what they say, start a dialogue among ourselves. All right. And you probably, when you think about this, you, you, the, the, the word that comes to mind would be the word ecumenism. And um, so some kind of uh, intercommunity, I guess, that's the whole point of the word ecumenism. You know, in 1893, World's Parliament of Religion in Chicago was founded. Then it merged and changed the uh, name to Congress of Religion in 1900. You know, it uh, said that to proclaim to be undogmatic. Well, that's a right. <laughs> In other words, no doctrine, right? No, nothing that, you know, I heard popes, uh, they would say, let's not talk about things that divide us. Let's talk things about that unite us. Oh, we, we do want to be united, don't we? And they have a formula. This is how we get united. We're going to remove ourselves from dogma and from doctrines and things that are kind of uh, edgy and uh, controversial. In... Uh, <clears throat> You know, and uh, that first uh, Congress, this first Parliament of Religion, so-called, uh, basically it was full of theosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Jewish influence, and so on. So we know what this is about, is Babylon in, in, in open sight. 1993, so 100 years later, they wanted to re 
revive this. This whole parliament well, lasted for 17 years, but the, somebody had this idea, we need to revive this whole idea. So you have the Catholic cardinal speaking, you have a neo-pagan speaking, Louis Farrakhan, do you know who he was? You know, he would be speaking there, you know, you would a Hindu, a Buddhist, and, and, and all these things. Except, uh, I guess, uh, somebody wouldn't speak there, and that would be, of course, a uh, fundamental Christian, right? I mean, uh, how could you even... Unless you want to tell them the truth, which uh, then you will be chased out very quick. 1980s, uh, you have a global congress by Reverend Moon. Uh, you know who, who he is? It's a Korean big church. Uh, I think they have like 20,000 members. Uh, so, uh, so I don't know what, what's, what's happened with that group, but he was a big, uh, big uh, name uh, back in the 80s, 90s. And so he was a founder of so-called Unification Church. And he wanted to go out there and start some kind of efforts to unite the, the world people. 1990s, you have a United Religions Initiative, which was driven by Episcopalians. 2000s, World Council of Religious Leaders. And uh, their motto was to end violence and to promote peace. Uh, 2000 to 2002, you had a Millennium World Peace Summit at the United Nations. Meanwhile, Let's go back in 1800s. 1800s, you have evangelical alliances. You have the so-called annual week of prayer for Christian unity, which when we grew up in Czech Republic, in our church back there, we were part of. So it would be once in a year, it would be only churches that would be non-Catholic. We would, we would visit all the other churches and, uh, and uh, try to bring some kind of unity or something. And uh, it was uh, one of the most boring week of the year, always. Um, because you had to be kind of polite and not complain. Alliance of Reformed Churches was next thing. Then you have our World Methodist Council. 1891, International Congressional Council. 1905, the Baptist World Alliance. 1948, in Amsterdam, World Council of Churches. Uh, of course, uh, after World War II, you have the uh, emergence of uh, changes within the Catholic Church that culminated in 16s and 70s in Vatican Council Number 2. And then came up with their idea of ecumenism and uh, interfaith dialogue. I remember when the uh, revolution happened in 18, 1889 in Czechoslovakia that uh, the president, the famous president, Václav Havel, he was really messed up. And he was bringing all sorts of people. And I, I knew this was wrong, you know. You know, I think it was called Open Forum, I think, or something like that. And he would have, you know, this Catholic and that Orthodox and that Rabbi and that Muslim and that Buddha. So it was like, it was like, uh, what's the word? Uh, it was like a carnival, like literally different colors. You had a white for the Pope. You had a black for the black uh, guy from Russia. You had the orange uh, coming from these monks in Tibet or something. Then you had this pinky or purple, some kind of Indian with a dot in the center. It's, it's like, uh, you know, when kids go to the party to pretend they are something. That's what it looked like. It's a joke. It's actually sad, uh, but it's like a, it's it's a, it's just a facade, obviously. And I want to uh, mention all these things. I actually was surprised how great and broad these efforts and long uh, have been. You know, I kind of think about ecumenism kind of maybe more or less a modern phenomenon, but it, it's been around for really big way for almost two hundred years now. And so uh, this is what we are in. And I think it's good to realize that non-believers out there, this is what they consider to be Christianity. Right. right? That's, that's the, that there's a lot of ignorance there. Uh, but of course, this is not uh, Christianity. This is, this is an easy thing. It's a power grab. It's what it is. It's a power grab. And especially when it comes to Catholic Church, you know, we may be arguing with the doctrines, and we should with individual Catholics, but if you really want to hit the beast into head, in the head straight and kind of, it is the, the, the main is lust after power. It's, that's what it is. And the doctrine is consequential. The reason why they maintain Mary is because it works to maintain their power grab. Because they um, do indulgences, because of their other doctrines, is because it promotes their objective, which is to grow, grow, and grow. And it is in a great contrast to what uh, John the Baptist said. John the Baptist was a man that experienced in his lifetime, he was definitely a good guy, good pastor in a way. He had certain following, and there came a point where his following actually reduced. And people started leaving him. And uh, 
uh, his disciples that stayed, you know, they said, oh, don't you care? You know, people are leaving you. They, they're all going to Jesus. And if, you know what he said, right? But what did he say? I must decrease and he must increase. So Christians can handle decrease. The Pope cannot handle decrease. That's why he's coming here, right? Uh, they, 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 they need to make sure that they keep growing. Right, uh, we go soul winning. You know, Jehovah Witnesses go soul winning because they must. We go soul winning because we want to. Uh, Pope shows up in uh, Parkland County because he must. Because uh, probably through lies, you know, there is a damage through the, this whole uh, school uh, school uh, uh, mortality of children, that sort of thing. Who knows how true that is? Uh, but that doesn't matter, right? It's a lie. And they know that lie works. They themselves use it uh, skillfully as well. So that's what it is. It's a power grab. It's a power grab, of course, for the devil. And unfortunately, to an unbeliever and many shallow Christians, this actually, when they look at uh, churches, uh, they may, uh, they, they are probably most of them apostates. Some of them may not be just ignorant and really blind and shallow. But it is... Uh, uh, these different councils and parliaments and everything like that uh, seems to be actually perhaps a good thing because after all uh, it is a blessing it is a pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity so we should embrace unity shouldn't we right and this is i wanted to explore this right because here is the thing the bible tells us solomon was a wise man he is the guy that came to god when god asked him and he uh, what, what is it that you want and he said give me a wisdom Give me the ability to discern between evil and good, between true and lies. And um, I always uh, compare it to a door. You know, when you have a house, you need to be able to get in and out. So you need to, that, that's kind of work. You could isolate yourself by just closing yourself, but then you're going to die inside. You know, you're, you need to be able to come in and out. Well, or you can just open it plainly. Well, then, uh, okay, you can come in and out, but now you are not protected from the elements and from uh, bad people. So you need a door, right? You need a door. You need to be able to decide. That's a, it's your decision. That's your head. This is where you decide. This is what I'm going to allow in, and this is what I'm going to reject. But that's not everything. You have a door. In other words, you have a freedom. You have a responsibility. But that's not where it ends. You have to have that wisdom, right? Because if you don't have it, you'll probably open the door to everything. Or maybe you will have the door, but you will close the door to everything like it happens to us. We knock on the door and say, no, thank you. That's somebody closed the door without thinking. Somebody uh, closed the door without uh, using any discernment. And so I think the trick is to have a door, number one. Number two, to know what to open the door to and what to close it to. You know, the Bible says that, you know, it is the right thing. It, it, there is a time to build and there is a time to destroy. There is a time to, uh, to love and there is a time to hate. You know, all these are opposites. And I think that's just the hinge on which the door is turning to tell, okay, what is it that I'm going to say yes to and what is it going to no to? So when it comes to unity, we don't want to be people that just close the door you know, be us here and everybody is, uh, you know, like the Amish people do. But at the same time, we don't want to just open the door to everything. So what are the two opposites here? We're talking about unity and, uh, and uh, pleasant harmony of Christians living together on one hand. The other one, the opposite of that is separation. And obviously it will take some wisdom and some uh, studying of the word to know what is it that we unite on and what is it that we separate on. And we don't want to be people that separate from the bad things, from the good things, excuse me, and uh, embrace uh, the unity of all the bad things, like these different um, uh, efforts that we just listed. All right? In Psalm 2, <clears throat> uh, you probably know the Psalm, Psalm 2 is a great psalm if you want to preach against uh, these uh, efforts. Psalm 2, right at the beginning, it says, Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers they counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What I see, and I think, um, I, think I see it right, and I know that I am in a bunch of uh, crowd that probably will say amen to this. 
but uh, so it's not difficult to say it here. But what I think, all these different councils and unifications and Catholicism and all that stuff, yeah, that is certainly push on the surface for unification and for harmony and peace and everything like that. But I said it's a power grab, and it's actually the council together against the United. That's a, it's, 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 it, I think it's important to realize that this is not just a bad idea. This is actually a good idea on their side to actually undermine the Lord and undermine the church. This is actually, actually, this is the opposite. It's not, it's not a bad idea. This is, this is evil idea is what it is, right? And so we clearly have to say categorically no, no, right? We separate from that and because that's essentially a lost world. In some ways, it's even worse than a lost world because it is so hideous and so dis divisive. and di It's actually divisive. And, you know, remember how the, the, the Lord, how in Daniel and many other prophecies, but especially Daniel, you know, you know the prophecy about this, uh, this uh, statue, for example, that Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of, right? So it started with the gold and then brass and all the way to silver and then brass, all the way down to the legs made of iron. And then at the bottom, you had a mix, you had the iron and a clay. And then the interpretation of that was that the kingdom will be partially strong and partially weak. And that's what I think we are witnessing. We all unite, but of course it's not going to be strong. But it will be strong in some way. You know, with a lot of hammer, I suppose. Um, the opposite of that is actually the path of separation. Uh, path of separation means it's going to be smaller. We are called narrow way. That, that's, an, that's a small path. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the path. And, but that's a path of division and a part of separation. Yet, we are talking about unification. That's something I find actually strange. In the Bible, the Bible clearly calls for unification, but at the same time speaks about separation. So, how do we marry these together? How does that make sense? Um, let's go to John chapter 10. Uh, there is a picture uh, given to us in many places uh, that uh, God knows how to be united. Uh, we are uh, in Christ. We have been baptized in Jesus. Uh, who was I talking to? Uh, there. You know, the, ba the baptism that we do in a water is really just a testament of what's happening, really, right? You don't really get baptized by water. That's, well, you get baptized by water. But when you're baptized in water, that's not where you get saved. But we are saved by baptism. You know that scripture. What was it? Hebrews, I think, right? What was it, Hebrews? I forgot already. Uh, but uh, even by a picture, we are saved by baptism. We are not saved by baptism in the water, but we are in some ways grafted in Christ. That's, so you must be grafted in Christ. You have to be uh, in some way, in some inner core way, baptized into Jesus. And then you go and baptize yourself in the water just to show the world. But uh, that's really, if that doesn't happen, it's not a big deal. You should do it though, but we know of a thief that didn't do it, and we know he was in heaven. So, but we gotta be part of the of the of the of the family of God. And when you are, then we are one with God. And uh, that's why when we read that uh, prayer of Jesus, you know, Jesus prays uh, for his disciples and for those that will come through the testimony of those disciples. So that includes all of us here. And he says, "Let them be one. Let them be one, even as." We are one, speaking about himself and his father. So he and her father are one. John 10.30, it says, I and my father are one. That's how unity looks like. That's what it looks like. Also, verse 38, the father is in me and I am in him. Complete unity. Of course, we know the scripture about the triune God, the scripture we go to. He that overcometh the world and believes. Okay, this is for John chapter 5. Uh, verse 5, he that overcometh the world, but the, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is, the, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And that's a key word. The Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 
And I know that when we think about, especially when it comes to the doctrine of, uh, of uh, that this is a, some kind of polytheism or something like that, then we say, no, this is one God. This is one God. Um, then, of course, we have to fight on the other side. People say, well, there's just one God and has three persons. Well, that we fight against also. But uh, there is three and yet they are one. They are, they are united. Uh, so they're not just one as number one, but I think the one means that they are united. That there is a complete agreement between them. Right? And I think what uh, the world is looking for in all these different efforts is how can we find an agreement? And it's a pathetic and useless effort because it never happened. Because you cannot unite with somebody that has a different truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, just, that's really that simple. Right? If you do a, a court, I don't know why it's so complicated, right? I mean, it, if you say, let's not talk about things that divide us, then, then let's not talk at all. I mean, I mean it's, if it's a core thing, right? That, that's not, that's, that, that, that makes no sense. You know, we can only unite if we all come to this, some kind of a merging point, and that merging point must be the truth. It's just a fact, reality, in other words. Well, this is what you believe, I believe something else. That's your truth. That's obviously, we are living in a postmodern world where everything is being um, uh, symbolized and uh, re relative make relative made relative and there are three that bear witness in her the spirit and the water and the blood and these three agree in one so that we have that agreement and how do you condemn if you're a judge how do you condemn how do you find out if you have two kids you have only one kid so it's a little bit different but i have several kids and i hear the conflicting stories of a conflict right how do you find out what is the truth you you can't just kind of guess it you can't just uh, be biased and lean towards one person. You've got to investigate. And what are you looking for? You're looking for agreement. Right? You're looking for uh, testimonies. Did you see that? You know, what happened? What happened? What happened? And eventually you, you pressure the kids, sometimes hard. And after a while, the truth will come out. And now we have, now we have unity because now we know what it is. It's, it's really that simple. Unity happens through the truth. Now... What is the truth? Jesus says, I'm the truth, the way and life. I'm the truth. So there is no other way to unite anybody except the merging point must be the truth. The merging point must be Jesus. And the merging point, in the end, we'll, you'll see, must be the Word of God. Because Jesus and the Word of God are identical. It's the same thing. Amen? So the Lord himself, he showed up what the unity is. He showed up uh, what is, that it's basically about agreement. It's about testimony that is in agreement. And so it is not up to us to go bent over and try to compromise and try to a little bit tolerate the other group. Okay, they're really weird. We need to put things aside and uh, things that are maybe important to us. But let's sacrifice that for the sake of some kind of a peace uh, among us. No. Now, that's, that even if you do that, you will still not have a peace. You will still not have a unity. It really doesn't work. So it's a useless sacrifice of the truth, plus it's weak and unfaithful, right? So uh, the world is uh, concerned that the Christians are divided, so they're going to come and fix it. <laughs> that's obviously pathetic. Um, it's not going to work. Let's go to John chapter 17 now. Um, so we read that at the beginning. Let me just go through certain key points. Now, let me just say this. Um, Jesus, when he prays to the Father, do you think the Lord will answer his prayer? I actually read this passage as this is deal. This is done. I mean, I know why I listen to Jesus here talking to his Father, praying to him. But I know that Jesus, when he prays, um, I may be praying for some things and God is not going to give it to me because he cares. Uh, so I don't always need what I really ask for. Uh, but God promised that he will uh, answer our prayer when we pray in, according to his will. And so I'm pretty sure when Jesus prayed that he prayed according to his will. So it's guaranteed. If Jesus prayed this, then God will grant it. So whatever we read here as a request, you can also read it. Okay, that's how it's going to be. Or that's maybe how we can even say that's how it is. 
All right? So when he says, um, keep through thine own name those that thou hast given me, he is asking, keep them. So to me, that's okay, he will keep them. Uh, also, he says that they may be one. Okay, that to me, that means that we will be one, or we are one, even as we are. Uh, look at verse 13. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. That means that we will have a joy, or we perhaps already experience it to a large degree. And then notice verse 14. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest keep them out, take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. We're talking about keeping still. And then he says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he says, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the truth. So we keep coming back to it. The truth, the word, Jesus is doing the praying. Jesus is essentially saying, Keep them through me. Keep them through the word. As we're walking in a circle a little bit. That's, what, that's, that's the only way we could possibly have a unity. And we know that uh, let God be true and every man liar. And so we cannot build. This is what some people do because they find somebody that kind of speaks the truth so that people flock to him and create a unity around the person. That's better than uh, flocking around a complete deceptive person. But it's still, you know, Jeremiah says, Cursed be the man that trusted the man. So even if it's a good man, even if it's a man that's 99% of the time correct, it's still weak. We have to go to the center. We have to go to the merging point, which is Christ. The truth is Him. Verse 21, He's praying that they all may be one, as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee. Uh, that they also may be one um, in us. That the, I noticed. He is praying so that we can be one, so that the world may believe. That's interesting. The unity of Christians has an impact on the world to believe. And I think that probably one of the motivations of these unification uh, efforts uh, by these so-called church leaders, these efforts perhaps are motivated by the desire to actually have more, in, a better reputation. Because obviously it looks bad when we are fight uh, with each other. So let's unite. Let's put our differences aside. And then just put a smiling face. Uh, you know, we're all happy. Come on, join us. And of course, that's not really how it's done, is it? Uh, but th there is a truth in that. That if, if we are united, then uh, if we have a harmony, if we have this unity that the Lord is praying for, then that will actually have an impact on the world. And they will, it will help them to believe. That's uh, his, that, uh, that kind of power. Uh, verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and, and here we go again, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So, I know that we don't want to overemphasize uh, a testimony by life and all that stuff, but we don't want to dismiss it either. Uh, so we need to speak the word clearly, but at the same time, let's not undermine the fact that uh, how we live and who we are can have a huge impact on, uh, on others. So the key words here I see, keeping. We talk about keeping, about security of your salvation. Jesus prays and he says, keep them. And he says, I have kept them. I have kept them except the son of perdition. But we know that son of perdition was son of perdition from the beginning. So it's not like God lost him. He was not part of the flock. We're talking about the word, the truth. We were talking about let 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 them be one, and uh, the impact of that on the world uh, that they may believe. So clearly, God's people actually are united, and I think it's a little bit like oh, sanctification. Is sanctification one time ordeal or is sanctification a process? Well, both is right. Uh, the moment you are saved, the moment a person is born again, that moment that person is separated and holy. That's why Apostle Paul writes to churches and he is talking to them as saints. Or the saints in Rome greet you or whatever. Because we are saints, we are holy, that's the same word. Um, 
Um, but then, of course, uh, we practice sanctification in our life. I mean, we separate ourselves from bad things. Uh, we identify lies in our life and we say, no, you are in a part of the Babylon and the Bible says, come out of her. So you come out of her because you don't belong to that. Holy things don't belong together with the mundane things, right? Special place, special people, uh, special, special beliefs. This is where it belongs. So sanctification is both one-time thing and sanctification is also something we practice, something we apply to our life. It's both. And I believe the same thing applies about unity. We are united. Even if we are uh, not understanding each other uh, or whatever, I'd say we are united because we are one in Christ. And uh, so we are united. And typically, if people truly come to the Word of God and, uh, and just, just are willing to, to just see it in a new way, uh, typically that unites people, right? It's just no more conflict. You know, that's gone. Um, uh, but it takes some effort uh, at, at the same time. Now let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's deal with... Uh, if we are talking about uh, unification and lack of unity sometimes, how come and how is it... And uh, I, I, you, you know, I know that, that there's a lot of people that look at our type of churches or whatever, and they twist their head, and they see a lot of divisions uh, within our crowd. And in fact, you can come to so-called United Church, you know, call themselves United Church of Canada, here, right? United Church, and uh, so they present, them, uh, present themselves to be united. They put it uh, boldly in their name. But I promise you they're not united. Right? Right? This, that's not unity. Um, it should be called something else. They're, they're like soldiers. They're... There, are, what's the word? It's like a military unity type, right? It's not a, the, the unity that Christ is talking about. But how is it uh, that even uh, b believers, even King James Bible believers, we still have disagreements and fights and uh, divisions? Um, I want to talk about that. Because remember, the key is to find out where do we separate and where do we unite? How, what's, the, what's the door? What's the, what's the litmus test? How do we decide what we accept and what we reject? Now, first of all, it's good to acknowledge that there is divisions in the Bible and even among brethren. Um, maybe you can help me. I have a few examples. Uh, but if you guys want to tell me a few examples of divisions between brethren. Anybody? Okay, that's uh, in a modern era. Very good. But I guess even in those days, right? Uh, okay, very good. Yes? Paul and uh, John Mark. Paul and John Mark or Barnabas, really? Right. That's where the fight was. Very good. Yeah. Did you say? I was going to mention uh, some people, well, most of our circles, we are not for the drums, but some circles have drums in church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there is, I don't know which church is it. Is it Methodist or somebody that you not allow any instrument? Yeah, uh, or no art, you know, no art. Everything has to be plain. You go to Amish, only black and white, right? Uh, so it's abomination if you show up with, uh, I don't know, a uh, blue shirt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no pun intended. But I said it. Um, um, you have a Jewish Christians and Jew, uh, Christians out of Gentiles. That was a big thing uh, back in the day, right? Um, you have James and John came to Jesus and say, can we be two on your left hand and right hand? That created what? Division. Uh, you have a Paul, Peter, James, Jude, Jude rebuking churches, rebuking individuals. But that's certainly not uh, some kind of a pleasant thing. And uh, presumably uh, some people... Uh, have a hard time with that and created certain divisions. So this is a little bit of a of a hamburger, right? This is everything in one. It's just talking about divisions, but we would have to actually separate each of them and study each one of them. Okay, what was actually causing the division in this particular case? Because some of these divisions may be justified. Some of these divisions could be uh, avoided and maybe were not necessary. Right? And that really goes to the heart of my question. You know, where do we decide that division or separation is, is, needs to take a place? And where do we decide, okay, we need to a little bit slow down and maybe build some bridge? Right? So how do you decide? 
because you can be just built. Uh, you know, you have uh, organizations that probably there is an organization like that, some kind of a, a non-profit thing that, that will call themselves bridge builders. It, it doesn't roll well out of the tank. So maybe there's something like that, right? I'm sure there's uh, people that have that kind of vision. We want to build bridges, right? So sounds good. But I don't know. I mean, uh, what if you have to, what if the right thing right now is to actually take the bridge and take it down? Maybe yeah, there is a time to hate, there is a time to love. Maybe it's time to build a bridge and maybe it's time to destroy one. That's my point. There's a time to destroy bridges and there is a time to build some. Second Timothy chapter 4. And Bible, by the way, uh, sometimes people, you know, shake hands and, you know, this is, this is the word of God. It sounds good because that's kind of what we we're talking about. You know, this is the place where we need to meet. And so people say, yeah, exactly. And they create divisions. It's not quite right. So just because somebody has a Bible in their hand is not a proof that they understand it. So even among brethren, we can be, or the word can be very divisive because... It is maybe misunderstood or uh, uh, there's a certain very strong bias and people are strongly believe. Yeah, let's say pre-tribulation, post-tribulation. Both camps believe that they base their belief on the Bible. Well, they can be both right. Right. So, uh, so and you know that it's sometimes almost uh, useless to, to even go there. OK, we, we are locked. I, I use the example of trench war. Right. We are in trenches. So, so it's, 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 it, you know, there's no progress at all. It's just, just there, unhappy and cold, somewhere in the middle of winter in the trenches. Um, so first Timothy, second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Are charged ye therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, we just talked about the truth, what it does when it comes to people being divided. It actually converges people together. The truth does. So, what happens when people seek and have itching ears and they follow these different doctrines that are not sound? following their own lusts. What does it do with their ears? It turns them away from the truth. Consequence? Division. Must be. Even without somebody intervening, it will just start to rot and erode and collapse. And if somebody wants to save it, he may come with uh, some kind of a piercing word and say, okay, you've got to stop. That will probably even exaggerate the division. Um, but at least, hopefully, it will save some that are not too far. So here we have a division that uh, is caused by what? It's caused by false doctrines. False doctrines cause divisions. Um, we live in a world full of lies. We have people in the United Nations and all these places, and they want to unite the world. <laughs> they don't even say, but they're going to unite the world. Obviously, that's useless. You're not going to ever be able to do that because you have no Christ. It's just nonsense. Hence, I don't even have to look at the proposal if it comes from Vatican, if it comes from the United Nations. I don't have to look at it. Right? It's, it's, it's not going to work. I'm not part of it. Amen. You know, we, we actually had people uh, in 60s, 70s, a lot of, uh, you know, Protestant evangelical churches, they and Baptists included, they would kind of, hmm, they heard about these different tones coming from Vatican, and they said, hmm, well, maybe we should have a second look. And they would come and, and maybe first listen and just sit there somewhere in the back. But, you know, it happens every year and, you know, they moved in their pews closer. Eventually they were allowed to speak and they would invite uh, the, the Catholic representative, you know, these different people come to their churches. Didn't realizing that this is a plot. That this is the Trojan horse. Right? You know what Trojan horse was about. You know, invite them in and they will destroy you. And uh, the, you're never going to be welcome. I know how Catholics are talking about uh, when they come to evangelical churches, they talk about unity and, and so on. But you can just tune to Catholic radio. I know you don't do that, but just it's good sometimes to do it, see what they are saying to their people. And they are very anti-evangelical uh, against Christians. You know, 
But, you know, when they're talking to us, you know, they put a smile on. So it's a conspiracy, just like uh, we read it in Psalm 2. Uh, so sadly and unfortunately, we do have divisions, and some of them are because of false teachings, because somebody departs from the truth. And there is no unity on the truth. We already established that. So the truth is important, truth of the Word of God. Um, now, um, we struggle with the truth, and uh, we deal with people. When we go soul winning, we can see it a lot. When we go soul winning or talk to an unbeliever, uh, whether it's part of a soul winning effort on the street or uh, just a natural dialogue that just happens on a plane or whatever, uh, we realize that there is an opposition, that it's a struggle. And it's a, it's, a, it's a patient work sometimes to bring the person to the truth. And sometimes you can only bring the person so far and they can't handle more than that. So, okay, this is where we're going to take it. Sometimes it takes certain repetitions and, and whatever, right? It's a long effort. But it's not, the end is not there just when a person gets saved. Right? Just like sanctification is a one-time thing, but then also there is a certain progress that follows. It's the same thing with uh, your self-submission to the truth. So when you receive Christ to your heart and become a born again, you have the truth, don't you? But on that particular point. And that's the most critical point. So that's where everything starts. But there is still a lot of, a lot of things that you're probably wrong on. Right? So, so it's not like uh, this opposition to the truth is completely gone. Have you ever caught yourself to be opposed to something that you later found out? Actually, they were right. Has that happened to you? And you feel probably embarrassed, right? Because maybe you made a strong point and maybe even destroyed a relationship or maybe you made a very uh, un unpleasant statement. And it's like, ah, oh. and you don't want to go back. Maybe there's not even a chance to go back. So you kind of learn from it. You know, like, oh, man. And it humbles you and probably makes you a little bit more slower next time to condemn somebody. Because you realize, okay, I really don't know. You know? And typically it goes with age. Uh, there's a lot of young people here. Young people, me included. Um, and I'm not going to make that mistake to be now 50 to pretend I'm young. Um, don't you find it amusing when a 50-year-old, there's a 60-year-old young. Okay, I mean, it's all relative. I guess in, uh, in uh, the first pre-flood era, 60 would be young. Uh, but 60 today is not young. You know, I don't say it's old, but it's not young. So I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not young. I still struggle with that, uh, to, to, to judge something too quickly. Because, because it just uh, checks certain points that I have very quickly in my head. Click, click, click. Okay, that must be wrong. Or I, or I develop a very quick and uh, strong bias. Right? And it's often uh, maybe too quick. And so naturally, this is something that's uh, uh, common to young people. Because uh, young people naturally are idealistic. We are, we are excited about somebody that has a vision and go for it. You know, like, uh, uh, what, was the, what was the girl in France uh, that led the nation to battle? Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, right? I mean, um, you can't expect a lot of wisdom from a girl like that. But there was a lot of vision and a lot of charisma, right? And she a lot of people to the battle. Well, how did it end up? In catastrophe, how about Hitler? Hitler did persuade a lot of people, and certainly I am pretty sure he told... I was listening to some of his speeches. I have a hard time to understand German. but So I listened to it uh, with, uh, with subtitles. And you know what? You know, one of those... You know? So, so I was actually curious, what does he actually say? Because people in English, they just look at it and say, that's evil. Yeah, but when you actually listen to that, when you actually listen to the words he says, th there's a lot of good stuff that he says. He told a lot of truth. You know, one of these speeches, uh, what do you think? The state is going to go get you? You need to help yourself. It's like, come on in. Preach it. Right, yeah. Yeah? yeah, so just because uh, someone, we have a certain bias, uh, th th that doesn't mean necessarily that person is, is wrong. At the same time, we saw that he was wrong. You know, he says, Gott mit uns. You know, God with us, right? God mit uns. And they always say that when they go to the war, God is with us. And then they lose the war. Yeah. Well, God doesn't lose wars. No. So uh, something is not right here. But he definitely did get a lot of people excited for his cause. And this was sincere. But people were really excited about it. 
And uh, before we condemn them, those stupid Germans, right? Before we condemn them, you would be deceived too, most likely. You have the same ability to be deceived by somebody that, that can really steer you up, right? So I think the responsibility is on each one of us to be aware of, for one, to be aware of that, that we have a tendency to be excited by somebody that makes the tomorrows look bright. And we want to, of course, we want to have a future. We want to have a certain great visions, uh, vision and certain, certain hope for tomorrow. And uh, by the way, my grandma wanted to move to Germany. Germany in the 30s was an exciting place to go to. Like uh, Germany before Hitler, people were committing suicide. Inflation was out of control. Uh, great Depression was everywhere. But in Germany, it was a super great depression. Myanmar Republic, it was really bad. Uh, but in the 30s, when Hitler cut off the Rothschilds, and he said, screw it, I'm not going to pay any of these reparations anymore. And, uh, German, and people say, well, that's because he was arming. That's a stupid argument. You can't really make a country suddenly be successful by wasting money in equipment they don't really use. Yeah. No, the economy was really robust and growing strong. So it was really exciting time to go there. And yet it ended up in a wreck. And it, you, people may say, well, I ended up in a wreck because evil forces prevailed. No, Hitler was not the Messiah. He was not what he, uh, you know, pained himself to be. And so it's good to be aware of that. I am scared when I, when I hear all these different people, these big names, you know, like um, Billy Graham and, and whatever, you know, they, they, have such a, they had such a great reputation. And then you listen to the person make statement like uh, you don't even have to know Jesus and you still be in heaven. This scares me. How did that happen? You know, like, how did that happen? How did you come to that? You know, I heard somebody close to me, a family member, and uh, suddenly, you know, that, that person said, well, I think he's in heaven. You know, he really cares for animals. I was like, what? <laughs> that, 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 that's not you, is it? It just surprised me. How could you make a shift like him? It scares me. It, it a little bit scares me that we are able to go off. And just because we are Christians, it doesn't mean he can go off. You know, David was definitely Christian when he killed Goliath, don't you think? Right? He wrote a lot of Psalms even before that. Then he wrote Psalms after that. He was a Christian. And then he comes to a point where he is so low when he comes to his heart with God. And he, when he is judging about this imaginary story, what to do with this guy that stole somebody else's sheep to give it to his guest, you know, and he made this judgment. That person is worthy of that. That's a sign that the person is not able to judge right now. The person, the person is saying, in other words, uh, and has that happened to you? Instead of, uh, instead of saying to somebody, no, thank you, you say, no, get out of it. You just slam the door. I've, I've done it. Uh, that's, that's a misjudgment. That's just too much. That's just not right. You don't see things clearly. And that scares me. That worries me. That I am able to go off track, even as a Christian. And so this is not just something, you know, lost people versus uh, saved people. This happens even in the church. We have a hard journey ahead of us that may be sometimes difficult because we're going to hear something we don't like. We're going to hear something that doesn't make sense, yet it's true. And so we're going we're gonna to be challenged to go to the scripture and see, is it really true? And when you, when you destroy that, when you say no, you better know that it's not true. Not just because... Well, that's not how we look at it. But that's a bad reason. Right. You know, if, you, if that's not how you look at it, because that's not how we do it in our church, well, then maybe, maybe the whole church is wrong then. Right? I mean, we, you know it's true. You have a lot of churches that uh, consist of uh, sincere Baptists, and yet they believe that the uh, nation of Israel is God's chosen people. Well, it's wrong. And they all believe it. So since we all believe it, we must be all right. But no. Somebody find it, please. <laughs> it's like uh, the bomb, eh? Like before it explodes. Let's go to another interesting scripture. Go to Luke chapter twelve. Luke twelve, verse forty-nine. This is going to be—I um, don't think it should be shocking to you, but it may be surprising to some people. But the Bible says here, Jesus says, 
Verse uh, 49, chapter 12 of Luke. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? So he's actually can't wait for this to happen. In other words, he's saying, I can't wait. But I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay. But rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in the one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against their daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus is an agent of division of all places and of all people. Jesus is divisive. Uh, we have a scripture from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus is like that. Of course, the Word is Christ is like that. That's the nature of the Word. And so we have times with the Word where it may be pleasant and very encouraging, but there is time where your, the Word, you read it and it pierces you because maybe it touches some nerve of what you're doing wrong and you know probably it's not right and now God tells you clearly it is wrong yeah. and now you don't want to accept it. So you struggle with it, and you, you can sleep on it, and I'm talking from my own experience. It, it, it bothers me about myself that uh, I struggle with uh, when God confronts me with the truth. And so uh, uh, that's what uh, we deal with. This is uh, what Jesus is. So um, um, now also notice what it says, verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. In other words, there is no person out there that is not exposed, or the Bible says here, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. So the reason why this hurts, why the confrontation by the word by Jesus is painful, is because we get exposed and naked. And who wants to be exposed and naked somewhere in a company of people? That's a terrible... I think somebody had like a dream uh, this nightmare that somebody would be naked. I, I heard many people had that uh, bad dream because it's something we are scared of, right? We don't want to be exposed. Uh, sometimes you may be completely dressed up. You still feel exposed. Let's say your emotions are exposed. I don't like to cry in front of other people. I feel embarrassed. I like to do it in private uh, because it, it exposes you and uh, it, it makes you feel uh, vulnerable. And we don't like that. And uh, yet before God, there's no hiding. We're completely exposed. Yet sometimes we play this game trying to hide before God. You know, let's just pretend it's not there, God. But it's there. And God, God knows that. And so, um, look, the, the word obviously is not here just to crush us. It, but it is there to expose us. Now, since we are talking about unity, how does that fit to the whole concept of unity? If Jesus is the one that brings unity through his word, how come he at the same time divides it? Well, it's, uh, it, it's inevitable, right? In order to be really united, you have to separate certain things. And that's really what the division is about. In order to really uh, come to the truth, you have to remove the lies. And that's really what it is. Remove the lie, that's the painful part, that's the divisive part, and then you come together and that's the truth. That's it. Now we know how to build a bridge, how to break it, or when to break it, and when to build it. And so uh, there is, um, you know, the Bible says that there is no creature that is not uh, manifest in his sight. Uh, it's good to uh, be mumble about it just because, let's say, I don't necessarily have problem with that doctrine like that person does. Well, I do have uh, maybe a problem in some other area. And so it's good to be humbled and, uh, and not puffed out because, as we know, the, uh, the, the truth uh, even though it's out there, we don't always see it quite right. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now, if somebody speaks and uh, talks about unity and peace among brethren, if somebody, I remember once, I, I came to a church, and uh, have you experienced this uh, before, that 
you were part of the group that, let's say, put a huge emphasis against Calvinism. All right? And that's a good thing to do because, uh, you know, the Lordship Salvation and all that nonsense is, is obviously very harmful and, uh, and deceptive. Uh, but there are certain doctrines that, Catholic, that Calvinists say that they're not necessarily incorrect. Uh, for instance, uh, that predestination, election. God knew a long time ago. God, you were saved before the foundation of the world. I mean, Jesus was sacrificed behind the found, before the foundation of the world. God knew all these things. So uh, I know that we struggle with this mentally. It's just really difficult to marry those two concepts. How is it that I decided, and yet God also decided? How, how, how does that work together? So I really don't know exactly how to explain it. I know that both are right. But sometimes you say these things and somebody says, oh, that's a Calvinist. Because he said the word predestination. Well, the predestination is a biblical word. Deal with it. All right? So explain it the proper way uh, compared to John Calvin, but there is a way to deal with it. It's there. Well, likewise, uh, sometimes when you start talking about unity, people immediately, okay, that's, some, that's something weird. You know, that's somebody that tries to unite us and basically uh, not be faithful to our values and that sort of thing. Uh, so we don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, let's separate. Let's uh, uh, accept the divisiveness of Jesus, but then also accept the unification force of Jesus at the same time. Both are important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, we read, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that, they may, that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. This is a responsibility of brethren uh, to be together and to work out the differences. There is a proper way to do it, not just, okay, let's do, well, he's kind of that, you know, this guy is, is a little weird, we're just going to accept it. No, well, certain things you have to accept, but certain things you cannot accept. So then we need to work it out some other way. Uh, okay, there's a discipline, for example, going on, right? We gotta deal with it. We we don't want you to go. Please, let's sit down. Let's deal with it, right? And sometimes it may not work out, but sometimes it will work out, right? And that's how we can have a unity. So, but this this kind of unity is not the kind of unity that these world unifiers are talking about. Um, uh, this basically means that we submit ourselves to the word. And the, the funny thing is uh, uh, about the world, they will want to unite the churches. Or actually, you know, they, the scope is much larger now. They want to unite the religions into one. Well, they, th that is useless because they don't have the word. So they don't have the divisive hammer or the divisive sword that Jesus is. Hence, they cannot separate things that actually um, mess it up. Look, look at this thing, for example. The Bible says, cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Right? So here we have a contention in the church. There is a division uh, happening and uh, it's actually because of a scorner. What's a scorner? Scorner is somebody that's puffed up and uh, uh, maybe blasphemer makes a fun of something uh, and it creates, it creates a division. How do you deal with that? You separate it. You, you cut it out. Now there's uh, three main culprits that I could think of that, or let's include it, let's include, include the one. So that, that's good. The one that's good is the division. There's no good division, but let's say necessary division and, and uh, justified. And that is uh, the division when we are divided on doctrine, on the word. Well, we must be faithful. We, God promised to keep us. We ought to keep the word. It's a two-way street. We keep the word. We are preserved. Um, Jesus says, sanctify them through thy word. I have kept them. How did he keep them? Through the word. The word and keeping goes together. So in order to preserve something healthy in a family, in an individual, in a church, you must be willing to cut things off. And that's super painful, uh, but, uh, but it's necessary. So that's the justified one. But there is other things that are not necessarily justified. And yet they divide Christians. I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, and I came out to three. Number one, pride. Um, Pride is the main culprit 
Um, the Bible says in Proverbs, this is Proverbs 13, verse 10, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advice is wisdom. Most, uh, don't you find it interesting the Bible makes these strong statements? It says that, in other words, it says, if you find a contention, there is a pride somewhere. Only by pride cometh contention. Now, it could be pride of the of, of, of one party or the other party or both parties. Um, but it is, it is by pride. Pride creates fights, divisions. They are not justified. Cast out the scorner. I already mentioned contention shall go out. Here's a person and you have to deal with it to a point of potentially even dislocate a person. Um, uh, but it could be pride on my side. Let's say you know the truth and that person clearly doesn't know the truth. So there is a justified division, right? Yeah, but you may mess it up. You may make it even worse by being puffed up because you know the truth. And this guy, like, oh. right? So you multiply the contention. So now it's even this mess, because now it's a division that's actually justified, but multiplied with the divisions is unnecessary. That's why when we go soul winning, when we, uh, when Apostle Paul, you know, instructs Timothy or Titus, you know, he's, he's telling them, telling the people the truth in humility. Be humble. Remember, you were there too, maybe not all that long ago. And I find it interesting, it's often the completely young uh, believers, they, they, they go out there and they're just going to fix everybody. Uh, that's a pride. And of course, it's not going to work out, even if you were correct. And of course, the chance is that you're probably not correct on top of that. So that's a big one, pride. Pride creates divisions and contentions. The second one I can think of is strictly foolishness. Just foolishness. Um, and foolishness is not necessarily just ignorance. I'll talk about ignorance next. Foolishness is it's a stupidity. It's a, when somebody doesn't know something, that's not foolishness. And uh, I, it may be stupid what they believe, but that stupidity came from somebody stupid. The person that believes it may not necessarily be stupid. Uh, foolishness is a, is a, is a, is a person that uh, has no respect to God, has no respect to the truth, is a person that uh, laughs at uh, virtues. That's, a, that's an idiot, all right? And that is definitely at the core of many contentions. A fool's lips enter into contentions, and his mouth call it for strokes. You know, Titus instructed by Apostle Paul, verse, three, verse 9, chapter 3, he says, avoid foolish questions. So there is such a thing that uh, is a foolish question. It's not a question that somebody asked, and it's a little funny question. Um, just the other day, somebody asked me a question. I couldn't believe that they asked that, and I'm not going to say because it would be obvious what it was. But I was, it was little. I was a little chuckling. That, that, that's, <laughs> how could you believe that? That's not what it means. Um, but it's still not foolish. It's a baby question. It's a, it's a question that's, uh, that's cute almost. You know, a, a little bit laughable, but it's not a um, subject of me despising it. All right? Just instruction, and uh, we can fix it. But the Bible says avoid foolish questions. And foolish questions is the questions that uh, Pharisees would ask. So how about this? Hmm? Should we pay the taxes or not? You know, that's a foolish question because there is certain disrespect to the Word of God. It's a disrespect to the speaker. And uh, it's not really a genuine question. Hey, I was always wondering, should we pay taxes or not? Right? Let's see, now, now it's the same question, and yet it's not the same question. So now it's genuine. So we deal with it uh, properly. Right? And uh, uh, I have done it, but I shouldn't have, and we shouldn't have. What the world? What, what, what kind of stupid question is that? <laughs> yeah? Well, now you're foolish. Right? I think now you're foolish and full of pride. So who's causing the division? So we need to have this discerning key. And the last one, I would say ignorance and miscommunication. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study, study, study to show thyself approved unto God, God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Most of the stuff, maybe not, well, most is pride, but a lot of, the, lot of fights out there. 
are just because people don't talk or people do not understand. And a uh, lot of biases are called, they, they're, they're sincere, they're respectful, there's no pride in it. And yet there is a tons of division, strictly because lack of knowledge. Um, if uh, my friend in, in, uh, in the Mennonite community, if he comes to his church and says, Bible doesn't say anything, that we must draw, uh, you know, ride on a horses and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a buggy. Uh, in their church, if you leave horse and the carriage, you are automatically out of the church. You can come visit. If there is a funeral, you'll be okay to come. But you cannot be actually part of the congregation unless you have a horse and a, and a carriage. So uh, that's strange. That's strange. Uh, that's ignorance. There is a lack of wisdom to, and I would say, you know, study to show us. I would say to them, study, read it, right? Study more. Sometimes it takes a lot of work, but that's the, the word study is painful. I never expected I'm gonna actually graduate from university because when I was a kid, I could not. I hated to study. I would be given the task to study. I would be staring out of the window, just looking at the kids how they're playing. That that was so painful for me. And so I couldn't believe that in the end, I actually ended up sitting on, a, on a, my butt for hours and hours, all the way to the midnight, the next thing again and again and again to study. And it is painful <laughs> in a weird way. And um, so it, is, it, is, it takes some effort. It's good to, that we gather in our type of churches, we study and we study for a long time, uh, that we take it a little bit deeper. And... Uh, don't expect it's always going to be exciting. It's just work sometimes. Okay, so we need to kind of chew through it. Another one, of course, is miscommunication. I, I, I can think of one very strange, uh, strong example in the Bible that just demonstrates that. Do you remember how when Israelites came to their promised land finally, that it was Reuben and um, God and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they say, we, we like it here, actually, you know, and this created a bit of a conflict. And uh, they were rebuked uh, by Moses, I think, for this, or, or Joshua, I forget, uh, th that uh, the idea was that, okay, so you're just going to leave us alone? And he said, no, 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 we're just going to kind of stay here a little bit, but we are going to go with you, I'm going to fight with you, and then when, when the land is ours, then we'll just come back and just live our lives here. And um, I don't know, I don't know what to think about it. I always thought it was a little little weak and premature, but I, the Bible doesn't really say that, so I don't want to necessarily over-speculate here. But the bottom line is that they decided to stay there. We know that they had cows, so it was ranchers, cowboys, and uh, I suppose that probably the country there was great for cows, just like Alberta is good for cows. If you want to have a you know 2,000 head cattle ranch, you're probably not going to go to BC, you know, Quenelle somewhere, right? You want to be in Alberta or, or maybe in uh, central BC, somewhere in Merritt or whatever. But um, so fine. I mean, this is, this is your, sure, maybe you can have this country. So eventually they did this according to this plan. And when this all was over, they came home and kind of life went on from that point. But uh, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, they actually went and close to the River Jordan, remember they piled this pile of rocks and it says, this is in memorial of that we are not just some, we belong to them. And uh, this news of this uh, stat, of this, of this thing made it to the mainland Israel. And uh, they were so upset and they as assumed that they are essentially separating themselves. And there was going to be a war. I mean, not they were, they were going to the battle. And uh, the Reubenites and Manasseh, they found out, it's like, what in the world? And they had to quickly, hold on, everybody. Let's talk it out. And when everybody exchanged their thoughts and what, what was really going on, ah, oh, okay, we thought, then okay, we can go home now. And so notice what happened there. It was actually a good thing that Reuben and Manasseh and God wanted to do. They wanted to remember we're part of this nation. We're part of this group. And the other side interpreted they want to be separate. Like a completely opposite. Right? And uh, what else creates these miscommunica miscommunications is gossips. 
or, or just uh, taking a statement out of context. And I don't know what, I almost feel like this beats a pride, but no, it's, it's a pride. And in, in fact, I think in it, it's actually quite a bit of a pride. And sometimes people are just happy to be, we are different than them, not realizing that they believe the same thing. They're just a little bit different. You know, some church, they are against the drum. You go to Africa, they go drum all the time. So what, we're going we're gonna to teach them to play Mozart? It will, you know, sometimes when we take the spiritual songs, you know, with the beat, oh, freedom, we ruin it because we play with organ. It doesn't work like that, right? You've got to play it a certain way. They have a certain way, certain music, certain style, certain culture. And uh, that, uh, uh, but, but we may have sometimes the attitude, okay, I never touched anything unclean. You know, the Puritans that have the shirt all the way down to uncles. Or uh, the, the culture that, that children are not supposed to play on Sunday like in that book uh, that the kids read, right? You know, all these different weird things. And then we assume the other ones, because they don't do that, they're not probably Christians. Miscommunication, lack of communication. I mean, this is also what's happening in our society. That's why we have that whole concept of liberty to speak. You know, it's a Lord, you know, the world, let us speak. Let us defend ourselves. We don't get a chance of that, right? You know, they assume, they talk to each other in schools and in their circles. You know, those stupid uh, Christians, they believe this, but they don't give us a chance to actually defend ourselves. And if you do get a spot somewhere to say something, they will butcher it and, uh, and uh, cut it short and pick whatever they want, right? Well, if the world does it and we hate it, then we shouldn't do it ourselves. Amen? So that's the third one. So let's finish with uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's just pause here. This tells me that it requires lowliness and meekness. See, can't have it with the pride. Pride is just about guaranteed it's not going to work. Number one. Number two, it takes some long suffering. <laughs> yeah. Takes suffering uh, to have a unity. It pains. It hurts. Right now, it's, it's like uh, when you meet somebody for the first time, it's, it's easy the first few hours or days and weeks. But then, you know, other things will pop out and it, you realize, okay, that well, from that point, it takes suffering. It takes bearing, forbearing, patience. What helps, perhaps, is uh, maybe the knowledge, hey, they have to bear with me too. So it's a two-way deal anyway, right? I think a lot of churches fall apart because of this. And then the person that leaves or, or is kicked out, whatever, typically somebody comes up with some kind of spiritual reason. You know, they, they, they are weak on this and uh, they are, uh, well, sure they are weak. And maybe, maybe, maybe even weak on uh, the, the, the spiritual things. Let's say somebody may be very strong in, uh, in uh, I don't know, preaching. Well, the person may be weak in preaching. So I'm going to leave because the person is not very good in preaching. I, I really like this guy. Uh, okay, so fine. I mean, that may be a good reason for sure. But... Uh, Aren't you just leaving because you're not willing to suffer the other person? I mean, the bottom line is, is he a good pastor, for example? Does he care for you? Uh, is he honest to the scripture? Does he study to show himself approved of the God? You know, that's, is he reputable? That, that sort of thing. Uh, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity. So it's endeavor. You can see that there is certain sweat in there involved. And notice, uh, there is one body. That's a unity. There is one spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, there is one Lord, there is one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. So clearly the Bible tells us that we have plenty. In fact, if you count it, it's a seven points. 
seven. And I, I probably think it's not an accident. It just happens to be seven. Seven important things that we unite on. We have one God, one faith, one baptism, one hope, one Lord, one body, one spirit. We have certain things. That are, and it's not just those that see each other every Sunday. It's the people you don't see every Sunday, but they basically confess the same thing. But they are different. Different building, different style. And that takes me to the next point. And that's verse 7. But, right? If you see a but... Uh, in, a, in a, any text, you know it's a contrast. It's a something opposite. And so on the other hand, you may also say, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of, gra- of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto, unto man. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. This is basically all saying that we have a spiritual gift from God who went down to hell, he went to heaven, and he gave us spiritual gifts. And we talk about spiritual gifts on, on, on Thursday. Spiritual gift is something to promote unity, to promote understanding of the scripture. Every spiritual gift is my bold statement. Every spiritual gift is all about the Word of God. Every one of them. And even hospitality, speaking of tongues, all these things, they were there so that people could hear the Word. Because it's all about Jesus. And uh, so if somebody has a gift, it's not for themselves, so they can pray privately in a language they don't understand to God. No, no, no. It's there to promote the Word. To promote the understandable interpretable word from God himself. That's the purpose of the spiritual gifts. And we hear here that it's given to us from Christ who ascended to heaven. And notice verse 11. And he gave some, right? So what we read before, that's to everyone. Everyone. We all have that same. But now we will see that now we don't have it the same. Because some apostles. Are you an apostle? No. Are you an apostle? Some prophets. Are you are you are you a prophet? Yes, you are a prophet. Uh, some evangelist. <laughs> right? Some uh, pastors, some teachers. You know the Bible and of course this is a list of 5. Uh, if you go to Corinthians, you'll see I think list of 12. And so it's not some kind of a, you know, finished list. God gives all sorts of gifts and whatever. Everything works for the same purpose. Remember, it's about the word. But it's not everybody the same. That the whole Corinthian church struggled with that, right? You know, they 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 had a lot of pride, elevated one person instead of elevating Christ. And what did it create? Divisiveness. And then I have this gift, I I you don't have that one. Well, you're strong in evangelism, this guy may be strong in hospitality. Right? Maybe very shy to talk to somebody. Right? Well, you're a bolt. You shouldn't compare. It's not fair comparison. Somebody is an eye and somebody else an ear. So there is a division, but I, it really is not division, is it? It's more, may I say, diversity. I know the word is destroyed, but, but it is a good word. There is a diversity. Diverse, diverse gifts and diverse abilities and diverse backgrounds and biases and and uh, different genders and all this stuff, too. (laughs) (laughs) Close call. (laughs) You know, and it's there for the perfecting of the saints. So we don't want all be the same thing. It's a good thing that we are all a little bit different and we need to embrace it. And problem is that sometimes a person becomes very strong. You know that in Pentecostal circles, take aside the fact that it's probably fake. I'm not so sure, but this whole gift of tongues, it, it's probably fake. But even if it was true, why does everybody have to have it? You know that's their doctrine. You must have it unless, uh, otherwise you're not baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's a false doctrine. You know, why, why does it have to be that that particular gift must be for everybody and everything else not? It's nowhere in the Bible. So, and it's obviously extremely divisive. There you go. Right? You know, believe the truth. Um, if somebody 
so, so here you go. Somebody, let's just say somebody had that gift of tongues and somebody didn't. Now that person that doesn't have it is going to feel awkward. And I know that's how some people, you know, behave in their, in these Pentecostal churches. I had a customer in a BC in Quenelle and I was talking to him. I found out he was a Pentecostal. So I asked him, so do you have the gift? You know, do you have the gift of tongues? And, uh, and I have tried to make sure that he understands that he is in a safe zone. And, um, he tell him, no, no. So how do, you, how do you deal with it? You know, how did you do that? And he told me, we, we fake it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they fake it because if you don't, well, you don't have it. But you have to have it. So you must fake it. Or you have to get out. Or you, believe, or you accept this terrible a pressure to be always this black sheep within the group because you have you don't have that time. so it's a terrible state of mind terrible state of things and uh, but before we mock them down beware that we may be doing it too just maybe not on the level of tongues right it may be something else you know he's not like him and i like this one better you know people did that with apollos because apollos he came and he spoke so great and people love to hear them apostle paul showed up and people thought, nah, that's a little weak. He's got a strong writing, but his physical presence is rather weak. You know, so, so this is not Christian. This is divisive. It's not right. And this is the world. This is the evolution of the world. What is the evolution? The survival of the strongest. The survival of the fittest. Christian, we take care of the weak. We don't look down on somebody that's not as strong in uh, their delivery of the gospel or whatever, or, or whatever it may be. There are people that are very bold. I went with you, Solvin Inc., and you're so dry. Um, just go through the fact, and it feels like nothing sticks. Like, I am very different, and uh, I enjoyed listening to you, you know, and I, I appreciate that, you know, I can be me. Yeah, you can be, you can be you. Different people, you have a women, have a different approach uh, to things than men, and men have to appreciate it, and not just see her, oh, well, she, uh, she's, she's lower, she's a weaker vessel, right? No, she's, uh, she's often, I would almost dare to say that she may be stronger vessel in some place, right? Uh, so some, sometimes the, 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 the things that we think are the weakest, they may be the toughest, you know, like, uh, and maybe, or more critical, or more uh, crucial, you know, unavoidable. And so, uh, you, you guys understand, I think, where I'm going with this. And so, in verse 14, we read, or actually 13, Till we all come to the unity in the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Why we do very, why we do care about this? Because that is essence of our unity. Without it, we start losing it. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that with which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Make it increase of the body unto the edifying itself in love. We're building a churches. We are building a communities uh, that uh, that where everybody can be a little bit different, but certainly pluck to the truth. But to demonstrate uh, that truth in a many different gifts, different abilities, uh, and that's what makes us extremely strong, because everybody can supply the thing that they can supply the best to the rest of the body. And finally, completely, last verse. Let's go to Psalm 139. How is it that Jesus prays for unity, but simultaneously is an agent of division? Because unity, again, is impossible uh, to be achieved without division. Now we know when it's time to break the bridge. It's time when we need to cut off the lie. And now we know when we need to build the bridge. It's time when we and the other are on the same page. And so we build a bridge. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. In other words, this psalm basically dares to ask God, Lord, 
our tendency is to hide from the unbearable scrutiny of the light of God's word. But actually, he dares to say, no, Lord, put it there. It shines there. Search. Try me. I, I'm sure if you do just a little job, you'll find something. Show it to me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked me, wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. That's the way to grow individually, but I think that's the way also to grow as a group in unity, one with another. Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for giving us Holy Spirit, one another, your word. We have a, such a uh, wealth in our hands uh, and in our hearts uh, to build our lives on and to also build uh, the church. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we seek your way, seek your will. Help us to be humble. Help us to uh, allow your word to crush us. Help us to not be stubborn and in, in opposition to your wisdom, to your word. But, and please uh, continue to challenge us wherever we uh, may be wrong. Help us to grow um, uh, both uh, in maturity and in numbers. Help us to be effective in our um, uh, soul winning efforts. Help us to be a blessing to the world around us. And Lord, by through, through our unity, uh, in your word, help us to be a light and a good testimony to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.